recording? All right. So everything is being recorded from this point on. Uh, the mic is actually pretty good at picking up you know, other people in the same room. So if you speak up when you ask questions, you know, it can be recorded too. All right. So are there any questions about the stuff that we talked about last time? No, no questions? OK. All right, so I am going to start with uh, practice questions, just so that we get a chance to kind of So this is all generated by ChatGPT. So we'll take a look at uh, these questions and see if we can answer the questions. First one, conjunction symbol. Explain what the symbol X wedge Y represents. Well, OK, I think it already self-explained. It is conjunction or logical and. Uh, how would you interpret this in a logical statement involving two conditions, X and Y? So the Basically, the operator or the result of the operation is true if and only if x and y are both true. So that would be the answer to the first question. Second question, disjunction in context. Given the expression x, and then th this is called the v symbol, um, describe what the symbol combination means. It is a or. How does it differ from x wedge y, you know, that's conjunction, in terms of truth values? So with the or, the only time it is false is when both x and y are both false, as opposed to what I just said about conjunction. We good so far? But you can, I mean, I know you guys know the answers to these questions already, but I want you to see what kind of question your chat GPT can generate. Um, that's kind of the whole point. Negation usage, what does this mean? It is the negation of x provide an example where you would use the negation of x in a logical condition. Hmm. Whenever you need to negate it. <laughs> uh, truth table for NAND. Um, so this is the NAND operator. We talked about it briefly. Okay, It is not one of the more useful operators from this class's perspective, but nonetheless we talk about it. So the truth table is going to be the negation of the AND uh, truth table. So unless x and y are both ones, you know, the result of NAND is always going to be a one. The only time the result of NAND is a zero is when both inputs are ones. All right, implication. The expression x implies y represents implication. Use the truth table provided in the material. Explain when x implies y is false. When x is true, y is false. That's the only time x implies y is false. Are we still doing OK? Do you guys want me to finish, finish this list? Or you guys are, OK. We're getting a general idea of what your chat GPT can do. Are we good so far? All right, cool. So I'm not going to finish this. You know, I just want to make sure that you know that it is here. OK, so this is one way for you guys to practice you know, after you know, each class is to use your chat GPT to generate some of the questions. Now, if you cannot answer some of the questions or if you suspect your answer or how chat GPT evaluates your answer is wrong, then you come to me. Then I can help you with, okay, this is the question, this is your answer, and then I can help you evaluate your answer. Is that okay? All right. This is great. I mean, this is kind of like having a professor that you can ask questions about, you know, like 2 a.m. in the morning or whenever you want to. And super patient, too. I'm not patient like ChatGPT. Yes? Yep. Um, so by the time we get to the first exam, I'll give you um, a sample exam from the past. So that way we know at least you know, what kind of question I was using in the past. So that, which is no guarantee of what your question is gonna look like, but most of the time it'll be similar, but not exactly the same. Yes, it's open book, open notes. There's no limitation of you know, how much material you can bring with you as long as uh, they're all paper-based handwritten or printed prior to the test. 
So if you find one of the screenshots you know, in the video to be useful, you can take a screenshot, print it out on a piece of paper, bring it with you, not a problem. Uh, for those of you who are who like to do research, you can find all my previous exams and bring that with you. It is not a problem either because I try my best not to reuse the same questions. But if you catch me using the same question again, guess what? You, 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 you have earned that, you know, those points because you know, I, I think I normally you know, would try my best not to. So does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, by the time we get to the first exam, I'll give you guys some ideas of you know, how to go about preparing for the exam. Okay. All right, so last time on Monday, we talked about um, Boolean operators. So we are pretty much done with that one. So now we are moving on to set notation. I changed the title a little bit sometimes. And this is how it's rendered. And you know, I think there are some problems with this page. So you guys will get to see how I fix those problems firsthand using GitHub. How many people already know what GitHub is and you have been using it for various projects? Very good. So the, the best of you, you know, if you have a chance to kind of use GitHub for something, which is just tracking changes, especially with text documents, try to get the experience because it's a good experience to have. All right, so we're gonna talk about uh, set notation. A set is a containment unit of elements. Well, that doesn't really say a whole lot. So the best thing to do is to give you an analogy. A set is like a folder, and then elements in the set are like files inside the folder. Is that okay? Hmm? Yes. So a set is a container, just like a folder is a container. The elements inside a set, okay, things that are being contained, they are like files or other folders that are contained in a particular folder. So that's the analogy. That's an easy way to, for you guys to remember you know, what it is because you know, I think all of us know, you know file folders on a computer. So the most basic concept of set theory or set notation is the concept of a set of set of a set containing or not containing a particular element. So that's the membership of something in a set. Is it a member or is it not a member? So now you guys may be thinking, because coming from uh, CISP 430 or 400, you're thinking about, so what is the type okay, of things that we can contain in a set? The answer is there's no limitation. Okay, so mathematically speaking, a set has no limitation of what kind of items it can contain. Is that okay? Because you know, that's kind of a big deviation from your programming classes where everything is strongly typed. So when, we, when it comes to mathematical concepts, a set is not typed at all. There's no restriction of what it can contain. All right. <coughs> An element can be just about anything that can establish your know, uniqueness. So this word is important because you know, we have to be able to tell a value apart from another value, or we can, or we at least we have to say, is this the same as that? Okay, if they're not, then they're different. If this thing is different from all the other things in the set, then it is also called unique. So in other words, given two values that may be elements, we need to be able to compare and see if they are actually the same value or not. So the equality symbol needs to be defined uh, you know, between all the elements, or all the things that can potentially be elements. Ordering is not needed um, for all the values that you're containing in a set. So there's no intrinsic ordering of things inside a set. For that reason, a set is not an array. It is not a vector because it is not ordered. Are we good so far? Kind of like files inside a folder because files inside a folder is also not ordered. There's no intrinsic order to the files inside a folder because you can tell the a, you can file fi you can tell file explorer and go like I want to sort you know, all the files by last modification date. You can sort by extension, you can sort by file name, you can sort by a lot of things. Because there's no intrinsic order 
of the items inside a folder. The same for the same reason, there is no intrinsic ordering of elements inside a set, even though those particular elements seem to have an intrinsic ordering. But it does it, it doesn't matter because the only question we need to ask about potentially in a value versus a set is is it a member or is it not a member? We don't need to know where it is in the set. We just need to know is it in the set or not. Is that part okay? All right, cool. <coughs> um, elements in the set are not ordered. We just talked about that. The last important concept is that elements in a set must be unique. So that means you cannot contain two elements of the same value. Just like in the folder, you cannot have two files of exactly the same name. What happens when you try to, what happens when you have a file of a particular name already and you're trying to rename another file to the same name? What, what do you think is gonna happen? Exactly. Or it might overwrite the, the original file, but you will only have one of the two left in that case. All right, so we are now done with all the concepts of a set. Now we can start to talk about um, notations. So here we have a notation problem already because it's, it's tossing the curly braces away. So now is a good time for me to fix these things because I I just converted you know, this module into um, Markdown, and you know, the conversion pr process you know, has a problem. So I'm going to fix those problems. And the way to fix the problem, I went in the wrong direction. So the way to fix the problem is go to here, improve this page by contributing and editing. And then now we have the editing window. And now I just need to locate this. Well, this is actually correct. It does have the backslash curly braids, but in the rendering, the curly braces are gone. Hmm. I'm talking about this part here. All right, so I'm going to talk about this first and then I'll quickly see if I can fix the problem. So we'll introduce some symbols. Typically, although not required, a set is represented by an uppercase letter. That's kind of the same thing as camel ca casing in object-oriented programming. Do you, are you required to name your variables in that way? No, it's just a convention. So in this class, my convention is to use upper letters to, for sets. It's not gonna be consistent all the way, you know, but at least for now, that's the convention. And then we are gonna use braces, you know, basically the curly braces to represent um, the beginning and the end of a set. So right here, there's supposed to be a curly brace you know, at the beginning and an end curly brace on the other side. But it's not appearing, so I'm gonna... Hang on a bit. Hmm? Uh, if you move the, the final minus sign, uh -huh. That's, this is it, what it's intended to be. You know, it, you know I want the, the whole thing to be um, in math rendering. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure why it is not doing that. Okay, if I just, okay. Let me check out the, the rest of this, whether the curly brace appears anywhere else. New, it took out all the curly braces. I didn't test this part when I was looking into the... All right, so how do we debug this? Two yes. Not two curly braces, braces oh, two backslashes. Okay. Because it might have taken you know, this, so we'll, we'll try that. Because you know, we might need to double escape the backslash. And commit changes. And this is the problem with uh, GitHub or the rendering of LaTeX format in GitHub. So this one does render correctly here, but it takes a little bit of moment. It takes a moment to update here on the other side. So we'll, 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 we'll talk about it using this rendering first and then we'll check out the other one whether it is updated correctly. So this is what I was trying to refer to a little bit earlier 
Yes. To ensure that using forensic means to both to open and close the container, we are using Chrome Embraces. If you want to demonstrate what elements are captured in the set, in this case, in the set C. Is that okay? <coughs> All right, moving on. Next one, the next one is how would you implement the concept of a set in C or C++ if you know ahead of time a set is only to contain, well, I'm going to say unsigned integer values. How would you implement a set? How do you check whether a value is an element of the set and how do we put elements into a set? So it's, a, it's supposed to be a thought exercise. There's nothing to turn in. I don't need you guys to write a program to do this. So, any ideas, any suggestions? Hmm? Use, a Use a vector. Okay, that's one way to do it. Okay. Hmm? Li library function. Library function. So the so there there's no library function to implement a set or the you know concept of a set. Hmm? So are you talking about adding the values to a set? I'm asking about the representation, like data representation of a set. So think about CISP 400 data structure. Okay. So instead of your know, heap and all the other your know, more advanced your know, data structures, I want to implement a data structure that allows me to represent sets of integers. Okay. Yes. An array. Okay. So that's a you know, that somebody else mentioned to you. Yes, you can do it that way, but it's not very efficient that way. Yes. That's even more <laughs> <laughs> involved. Yes, you can. So it's not a wrong answer, but you know, in a lot of programs, we want the simplest, the most efficient way of representing a set. Okay, let me tell you why there's an application. Question? Yes. Okay, so why, why do we need to represent the concept of a set in low level, I'm talking about low level C programming, okay? Um, there, is, there are a lot of system functions in regular C because C is a low-level programming language. So there's one function you know, that can watch events associated with files. In other words, you can tell your program to basically halt, okay, you know, put itself into suspension, unless one of the files that you are keeping an eye on has something for you to read. So for the most part, you know, it's, it's, it's stationary, nothing is happening, then your program is just in suspension, it's not using any uh, processing resources. But as soon as one of the files has bytes that you can read, then it will wake up your program so it can continue processing, it will grab whatever the content is. So why do we need this kind of mechanism? The simplest explanation is a web server. So you're implementing a web server where people can you know, you know, launch their HTTP request to. So you might think, well, when you get in that case, you know, we just serve one connection at a time. Well, how long does it take to download you know, uh, a web page over the internet? Let's call that 30 milliseconds. Okay, you know, which is you know, uh, about you know, one thirty third of a second, that sounds really fast, right? But in computer time, it is awfully slow, okay? What is the clock speed of your processor? What, what kind of order of magnitude are we talking about? Three gigahertz or so, right? Um, how, and in three gigahertz, how many cycles do we have per second? Eh. Hmm? Three billion cycles, right, per second. How many cycles do we have in 30 milliseconds in that case? <laughs> Let's try to do the math here. The bottom line, okay, so I'm gonna give you the bottom line first and then we'll, okay, I'll do the math too. Nope, wrong thing. forgot to change the scale on my side, so I have to kind of, I have to look so close, it's almost smelling 
the monitor. Okay, so we are talking about the you know, number of cycles at 3 gigahertz in 30 milliseconds. Okay, how, how do we work this out? 3 gigahertz means 3 billion cycles per second. So we multiply 30 milli, which is 0 0.03, to th 3 billion. So what we're looking at here is 3 billion, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, times 0 0.03 because you know, that's, th that's 30 milli. So, so how many, wh what are we looking at here? So we know there's a nine, right? And then the point three, point zero 0.03 is gonna cancel out two zeros, so we still have seven zeros left, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. That's just you know, me doing my quick calculation here. If you have a calculator, you can double check. So we still end up with a lot of cycles. We have a number of zeros, yep. So that's 90 million cycles. How many cycles does it, does it take to execute a typical instruction on a modern processor? One. So you could have done a lot of calculations when you are just you're know, doing the I/O, your know, input/output, with your network controller. So you don't want to waste that time, okay? Which means the packet comes in, you know, like bursts. So you want to be able to just read the file when there's something, and then when there's nothing you know, to read, you want to kind of give up the processor so that other tasks can make use of the processor. The bottom line is um, the mechanism that I just talked about. There's a mechanism for you to say, okay, I'm gonna pause here if none of the files that I am watching has any activity. Because that may stay for another five milliseconds. To you, it's nothing. To the processor, it's a long period of time. So now the question is, but which files am I watching? Well, it would be very cumbersome if you, on, if, if you can only watch one file at a time. Because when you are a server, when you're a web server, there'll be multiple connections you know, you're making simultaneously. So it cannot just be, oh, I'm just gonna watch this one file. You're gonna have to watch all the files corresponding to the connection that are active. So let's just say that you, know, you can have up to 128 uh, simultaneous connections. Okay, so how do you say, okay, um, all of these you know, are being watched, all the ones that are active are being watched. You have a set, but it's a set of what? How is a file identified inside, an operas inside the operating system? Some kind of ID, very good. And an ID is nothing more than an integer, that's right. So that is why we want to have a efficient mechanism to represent a set of integers. We feel okay so far? This is a little bit ahead of your classes because none of the classes that you take here will talk about this. We used to have a class that talks about this um, if you move on to SAC State, there is a systems programming class, and they will talk about this also in that class. But anyway, the bottom line is there is an application to implement the concept of a set very efficiently, um, and the way to do it is called bit masking. So what is bit masking? Does anyone know the term bit masking? Okay, how, yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Exactly. You use bitwise and to confirm whether a bit is a one or not, and then you can use bitwise or to set a bit to put that one into the system, and then you can use uh, 
Tilde, which is bitwise not combined with bitwise and in order to clear a bit. So anyway, there, there are a lot of bitwise operations. They're very fast operations, and they don't use up a lot of space. If you use a linked list, that's going to take up a lot of space. Okay, but if you use bit masking, it's really kind of condensed. It's not the most concise way to represent a set, but nonetheless, it is a very efficient way to represent a set. And that's exactly how a set of file handles are represented, is represented in low-level C programming. So you will need multiple things. So each, so let's say you have 64-bit integers. So one 64-bit integer is capable of representing a set of integers from 0 to 63. Because one bit is independent to all of the other bits, so you can say this bit over here is representing the presence or the absence of this integer, the integer that's corresponding to the bit position. So if you have 128 files, then you need two 64-bit integers to fully represent that particular set. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you are saying that a set is a list of multiple files, right? It's, it's not a list. It is a, OK, so in the context of what I just talked about, you are trying to implement a set of integers. So you're basically checking if five will be in the set or not. But in order to represent whether five as an integer is in the set, you set which five of the integers to be one. In order to check whether five is an element in the set, you look only at bit five of the integer. If that bit is a one, it means five is indeed in the set. If that bit is a zero, it means five is absent from the set. And this five couldn't be be a uh, file also, it's a type of file also, or just uh, integer by itself? It is just an integer because you're inside the operating system, you know, in the program. Every file that is active is represented by a file handle, but the file handle is nothing more than just an integer. So that five is uniquely representing a file that this process needs to have access to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are all low-level operations, you know, extremely low-level operations. All right, so the next section talks about equivalence of sets. In other words, if I give you set X and I give you set Y, how can you tell whether they are the same or not? So the explanation here is uh, we lack the precise mathematical notation for this kind of discussion, but we can still use English to briefly describe it. Let's say we're interested in whether set, a, set S and set T are the same. The two sets are considered the same when every element in S is also in T and every element in T is also in S. If this requirement is satisfied, then we say S and T as two sets are the same kind of makes sense, right? Okay, If they have the exactly the same elements, no one has one more or one fewer, then they are considered the same. So I do have to give you guys a little bit of warning, you know, if you are into programming, you know, especially in JavaScript. Of all the programming languages, C, C++, Java, and so on, JavaScript, which is not even a compiled language, it is a scripting language, actually has set as a prerequisite um, part. So you can basically just say, oh, I need a set. You have to use a new operator to create a set, and then you can start to put things inside the set. But when you compare a set versus another set, it is not really comparing the membership, it's comparing the address of the object. So that comparison, that equivalence comparison, is not looking at membership, it's just looking at are they the same object? Do, are, they, do, are these two things references to the same object in memory? That's all it checks. So it's not the same thing as what I'm describing here. So if you ever have a chance to program in JavaScript, remember that. Yes? Even if you use a prefix, yes? So 
the triple equal does not help in this case because the two objects have the same type. The triple equal versus the, the, the double equal is there's no automatic type invariant. So I think if both of these are references to sets, it will still be okay. So the key is it's not comparing the content of a set, it's just comparing where is this object, where is the set object located in memory. If they are the same object, then they are considered the same. If they're not the same object, even if they have the same membership, it is still considered duplicate. So it is a little bit tricky because you know, it's, it, it, when people tr start to program in JavaScript the first time, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that hurts. All right, the next thing is, can we have a set that is a member of another set, as an element of another set? The answer is yes, you can do that. So recall to qualify as a potential element, a value must be comparable to other values in order to see whether they are the same or not. In general, if you have two values, x and y, knowing that x is a set, this is how we can determine whether x and y are the same or not. So this is one of those cases where I do not use an uppercase to represent a set because x and y can be any value, just that ju it's just that in this particular case, they are both sets. So if y is not even a set, then you have a type mismatch, so they're different. If y is also a set, then we use the discussion a little bit earlier um, to determine whether they are the same or not. So a set can be compared to another set, but if a set is compared to anything other than the set, then it is automatically not equal to. All right? <coughs> and this part here is difficult to read because you know, it, once again, it is lacking the uh, curly braces that I need. So I'm gonna go fix it. There is one um, rendering of the same note here that has everything correctly specified, but um, I might actually go ahead and do that because all the, oh, okay, I cannot do that. I was just thinking to use um, a VI you know, command to replace all single backslash with double, s uh, all single backslash open curly brace and all single backslash close curly brace to have two double backslashes, but I can't do that because I'm not using VI. This is not a VI interface. There's a way to, for me to use a VI interface in this environment, but I'm not going to do that. So I do apologize for having to revise the notes as we go over. All right, so this is now rendered correctly. Now that we can compare a set with anything for equality, it is not surprising that a set can be by itself an element of another set. So the rule is a set cannot be an element of itself. Does that make sense? Okay. Just like a folder cannot be the folder containing that folder itself. For example, if I define x like this, how many elements are in x, by the way? Three. three. Yep. It has three elements. A is an element. B is an element. The third element is a set that turn out to also have three elements in it. So when you look at something like this, the folder analogy is also gonna be helpful because this is almost equivalent to a folder that contains two files, A and B are individual files. But the third item in this folder is by itself a folder also. And that folder, the nested folder, contains the files called one, two, and three. So that folder analogy is really helpful because you, know, you, you already know, oh, we can have folders inside a folder, inside a folder. And as a, you know, this for the same reason, you can also have a set inside another set inside another set. Is that concept okay? All right. So now the next question is, what if we want to specify a set that has an infinite number of elements? So I think for now, I'm going to switch back to my old notes, you know, which does not have the problem of having all the curly braces gone. So this way, you know, it's not going to be confusing in the class. So let me switch to that. So https dtkb.org 
modules. I think this one's module. HTML. Yeah, this one has everything rendered correctly, you know, but I'm trying to get everything over to the markdown format. <coughs> Unfortunately, the software that's doing the conversion is not at fault. What is at fault is the rendering of markdown on GitHub's side. But I have to discover that to find out. Okay. So if we want to um, specify a set of all even integers, how would you go about doing it? So one way to do it is to show it by example. So this is you know, one way to say um, E, which is the set of even integers, is a set because of the curly braces. And I'm just using dot, dot, dot here to just do it. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff before this. And then we have negative four, negative two, zero, two, four, and then a whole bunch of stuff after that. But there are multiple ways to interpret this. There's no guarantee that the thing before negative four is supposed to be negative six. There's no guarantee. So if you just show this to somebody, someone may say, oh, you're trying to tell me this is a set of all you know, um, integer, um, even integers. But that's not the only interpretation. There's no, it, it can be ambiguous. So we don't like things to be ambiguous. So what do we do? Hmm. So what we do is we change the notation to this. So I'm going to just you know, point out, point to this portion here, and then I'll explain it. So the way we read this, okay, it's usually helpful to be able to read the notation. This basically says uppercase E is a set, okay, because of the curly braces, where each element x in the set has to satisfy this particular requirement. X has to be an element of this funky looking Z, which is the set of all integers, and X mod two has to be zero. In other words, instead of spelling out or giving examples of elements in a particular set, I am specifying the qualification requirement to be a member of that set. Yes? It is if and only if. Yep, that is correct. Yep. Oh, uh, what's the last part of the mod two here? Okay. The first part means you know x is an integer, right? So knowing x is an integer, the mod two, this mod here, is the spelled out version of the percent operator. So what does it do? What do, what does the percent operator do? If I say okay, I'll give you a concrete example. 27 mod 5. What is 27 mod 5? Exactly. So in this case, what is it? What is 27 mod 5? So 2, because 2 is the remainder of 27 divided by 5. So instead of using the percent symbol, you know, which is not math, you know, which is it's not used by mathematicians. Mathematicians use, you know, they spell out the mod operator or the modular operator, so that's why it's spelling out X mod. But it really is the same as the percent symbol. So all right. <coughs> so do we have any questions about this notation? The set notation, the containment notation, the curly braces tells you that I'm describing a set. But inside the description, this is basically the name or the format of each element in this particular set. And then what is to the right-hand side of the vertical bar, as you pointed out, is the condition that has to be true if and only if. Okay, let me say that again. If and only if this condition is true, X is a member of E. Wait, why is it if and only if, and not just if or only if? So let's take a look at the, th at the two scenarios because you know, this is a good opportunity to look into what is implication versus what is equivalence. Okay? But I'm glad that you 
remember to use if and only if, because it, otherwise it would not have been correct. Okay, so if I say something like this, okay, x is an element of E only if x is an even integer, okay? Okay, so let's say this is what I'm saying. Okay, I know this is not even only if because I want to give you examples where it doesn't work out the way we think it should work out. So let me ask you, in this case, um, is one a member, oh, okay, is one a member of E based on that description? Okay, it's not, okay, because only if is telling you the minimum requirement to become a member of a set. Okay. So let me ask you another question. Is two a member of E? Aha, uh -huh. who said maybe? Very good, okay. So for those of you who said or think about maybe, you are correct. Okay, so let me just answer the question here. The answer is no, for sure in this case. This one is a maybe, because I am only specifying a necessary condition to be a member of the set E. It is not necessarily sufficient. All it is saying, okay, if I say x is, x is an element of E only if x is an even number, means that every member in E is an even number. But E can be empty. It can be an empty set. Because nobody says right here that every even number has to be in E. It simply says every member in E has to be an even number. Does that make sense? Yes, I will. <laughs> yes, I will. Okay. This, is, this is a good example of, yes, I understand every single word of the sentence, but I need a little bit more time for the entire thing to sink in. Okay, so let me say that one more time. I cannot remember what I said. <laughs> but I'll try. That's why the whole thing is getting recorded, right? Um, so this particular statement is saying, if you pick anything out of E, look at it. It is guaranteed to be an even number. But given an even number, there's no guarantee that it is a member. I'll give you a gross example. Okay, I know some of you are going to gross out on this one, but I'm going to use it anyway. The men's bathroom. Okay. Okay. Pick pick whatever gen. Okay. Pick a gen. Um, so at the door, there's a there's a there's a sign that says that this is you know bathroom for this particular gender of people. Is that okay? This is basically it, because if it says it's a uh, let's say men's bathroom. Does that mean every man is in that bathroom? Yes. <laughs> no, it simply says, you know, in order to get into this bathroom, need to be a man, right? But it is entirely possible at 2 a.m. in the morning that the, there's nobody in the bathroom. It specifies a necessary condition to be a member, but it is not a sufficient so far? So you're saying the only way to be an even number is not to say you can necessarily pick part of the member of the, the set? A, a particular even number is not necessarily in E based on this description. All it is saying is if you choose, if E is not empty and it has at least one member, that member has to be an even number. Yeah, every even number can potentially be a member, but it doesn't have to be a member, okay? So let's flip this around, okay? Because what this is really saying, okay, let, let me use the implication operator to specify this. Yes? So if I say six is not a member of E, it does not conflict with the statement that I have made here. Yep. 
So the way to use the implication operator in this case is a little awkward, okay, because it requires the use of negation. So basically it is saying um, not x is an even integer implies not x is an element of e. That is what it's saying. And then you guys may be thinking, is that not really required? Uh, because uh, are we double negating things and making things more complicated than it needs to be? No, this is actually required. Okay, the negation is needed. But there's one more way to say this, is th so that it is so, so you don't need the not here. You can reverse the implication the in the other direction. So you can basically say, okay, I have to I have to think about this. Um, X is an even integer is implied by X is an element of E. So you can also say the other way around, which is X is an element of E implies X is an even integer. So these three statements basically say exactly the same thing. So I take I take it I I take it back, you know, there's a way to express it without negation, so I'm gonna take this one out <coughs> because you know, it, it adds to confusion. Okay, and I'm gonna take this one out too because you know, we never talked about you know, the implication operator you know, backwards. So this is the equivalence, okay? If I say X is an element of E only if X is an even number, and X is an even integer, then I am saying that if you choose any element out of E, it, is an, it has to be an even number. All right? So if this implication itself is true, how many times, uh, what scenarios can make this implication true? If you look at the left-hand side, this is called the uh, precedent, and then if you look at the right-hand side, this is called the consequence. Um, we'll just say left-hand side now. There are three ways to make an implication true. Both sides are true, okay? So think about that. Both sides are true, so that means we are looking at an, uh, two being an element of E, two is also an even, num even integer. Is that right? Yes, right? Okay. What about the second way to make an implication true? The left-hand side is false, and then we don't care about the right-hand side. So there are, two, there are two cases. So when you look at the left-hand side being false, x is an element of e is false, then the implication is always true. So that means if 3 is not an element of e, then we don't even care whether 3 is an even number or not to make the implication true. We substitute 3 as x, and you tell me whether the statement is true or not. In other words, you spend another 30 bucks to buy this statement. Are you going to get your um, money back? 3 is an element of E only if 3 is an even number, and so is 3 a so if this statement is true, is 3 an element of E? The only way to make an implication false is what? That is correct. So that means you know, the only time this holds you can get a refund is 3 is an element of E is true but it is false that three is an even number, but three is an even number is false. So that's the, so that cannot happen. Okay, am I making it worse? Yes. <laughs> yes. So
So I, okay, this is okay. E being an empty set is consistent with what I just said here. X is an element of E if and only if E is an even number. Um, e containing two, four, and six is okay. Because in this case, you guys will go like, what about eight? Eight is an element of E, but eight is not, you know, an eight is an even number, but it's not an element of E. But because X, because eight is an element of E is false, then it doesn't matter what comes after it because it is an implication. So as long as you know, something is not an element of E, I don't care whether it's an even number or not. Is that okay? So I'm basically saying your know, possible cases here. Possible cases, okay. So now we flip and we repeat the same sentence, but we take out the only to see what it's done here, okay? So I'm gonna take out the, the only. So now the sentence says, x is an element of E if x is an even number. So in this case, x being an even number is now considered a sufficient condition to be a member of E. We good so far? That means every even number is in E. Okay, that's the first thing we know. Okay, every, every even, every even number is a member of E. Okay, but I'm gonna ask another question. I'm gonna ask, can 15 be a member of E? The answer in this case is yes, it can be. <coughs> because I just specified a sufficient condition to be a member of E. I didn't say that is the only sufficient condition. Are we good so far? So when I add if and only if, what is changed? If I say if and only if, then either side becomes both necessary and sufficient for the other side. Is that okay? So that means if you tell me that something is an element of E, I can automatically conclude that it is an even integer. If you tell me that something is an even integer, I know automatically it is an element of E. And vice versa, if you negate it, it works that way too. If you tell me that something is not an even number or even integer, I know already you know, right away that it is not a member of E. But if you tell me something is not a member of E, I also know automatically it is not an even number. So that's why it is important to specify if and only if, because if you specify only if, you can miss certain things that should be in E. If you only specify if, then you can contain additional things that does not belong in E, when you only want integers, even integers to be in E. It is only when you use the word or the phrase if and only if, that we limit the membership to only things that are even, but everything that is even has to be a member of E. Is that discussion okay? <laughs> so which way is better, the truth table or th looking at things as necessary versus sufficient? Okay, how familiar are you guys with the term sufficient versus necessary? Okay, I think some of you have you know, mastered you know, those two terms already. So I'll give you a few more examples. And this, these ones you'll remember for sure. Getting a bachelor's degree in computer science is a necessary condition to become a software engineer. What does that mean? So in two, three years, you guys are getting your bachelor's degree in computer science. 
So can you come back and complain to me and go be like, Tech, I cannot find a job. You cannot, okay? Because it is a necessary condition. It, I, I'm not saying that it is sufficient. It, it, it's not a guarantee that you will land a job. Is that okay? So on the other hand, if I say, you know, water is a sufficient, okay, that, that doesn't work. I'm trying to find a sufficient you know, example. <laughs> and I want to find a positive example too. So you know, I, I have some negative examples, but I want something to be positive. Okay, this one is hypothetical, okay, so don't quote me, okay? Having internship experience is sufficient to land a job. Okay, that's, that's a claim, okay? If that claim is true, then what will you like to do? <laughs> Everybody will try to get an internship because you're having an internship as an experience is basically, if it's sufficient, it's a guarantee. It guarantees that you can land a job. Is that okay? So is, is it okay now to be different and the contrasting property between necessary versus sufficient? Okay. All right. So getting back to the notes. So this is basically just, you know, instead of spelling out you know, the actual condition, I am replacing that condition with what I call a predicate. So a predicate is basically just a fancy name of a function that returns a Boolean value. That is all what, what a predicate is. So a predicate, once again, is a function that returns either true or false. So when I use this notation, it means x is a member of E if and only if P of x is true. That's basically what it means, which is also basically saying the same thing here. X is a member of E if and only if P, the predicate, is true. So in, an earlier, in the earlier example, the predicate is basically implemented by this conjunction here. But I'm using a predicate here ju just as a placeholder of a Boolean thing that has to be evaluated. If that thing is true, that is both necessary and sufficient for X to be a member of E. So it's a notational kind of thing. <coughs> so are we still doing okay with the, all this notation? All right. Um, we can have a set with no elements. It is called an empty set. Is that surprising to you? Especially, you know, Earlier, remember I said you know, a set is like a folder. So can you create a folder that has no files in it? Yep. Okay. So it's not surprising. Um, so with all of this stuff done you know, by section six, we will move on to section seven that talks about set operators. So the first bunch of set operators return a set. The second set of your know, operators return just true or false. So we'll take a look at this one first. This is called intersection. So the intersection between A and B, A has to be a set, B has to be a set, is also a set itself, where the membership is determined by E in A and E in B. This symbol here that looks like a funky you know, E is member of. So basically what this is saying is also this. E is a member of the intersection between A and B, if and only if E is in A and E is in B. Do we have any questions about intersection? Yes? The upside down meaning what? The upside down, upside which down one? Like upside down U, you mean this one? Yeah. Intersection. So this is the intersection between A and B. This topic is usually explained using a Verne diagram, um, which is kind of like a more pictorial way to say this. So I'm gonna draw a picture here. So if this is A and this is B, okay, yeah. Can people back there, can you still kind of see? Okay. So 
So if I use you know, this kind of hashing to represent members of A, and this kind of hashing to represent members of B, then the intersection is just this portion here. Because you know, those have to be the elements that belong to A and B at the same time. Can't you find an intersection there to get A and B and then keep those elements at the intersection and those ones? I think there's two for R and two R and they have different elements for R and they have other different intersections. Um okay that you have to be very careful because when you are using the join operation yeah. in SQL, it is not an intersection. It is more of a connection between things using a key, a primary key, and a foreign key. So that is not the same as the intersection that we are talking about here. Mm -hmm. Because a join operation can also be joined using a different condition. So you, you may not be looking at exact match. It can be any condition. Because when you use a join operation, you can specify the on expression, which can be any Boolean expression. For those of you who don't know SQL, you can just ignore what I said. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> All right. So the next one up is called the union. The union is kind of the or version of an of an intersection. So the union between A and B, A has to be a set, B also has to be a set, is also a set because of the curly braces, where the membership is determined by the condition that E is in A or E is in B. So that means, in this case, everything that is A in A or in B are members. Okay, I'll give you concrete examples in this case because I think a concrete example would be, would serve really well. So if A is the set of one A, B, and C, and B is the set of B, C, and D, then A inters the intersection of A and B, intersection of A and B is what? Everything that is common, but since this is a concrete case, wh what are those? B and C. You can list it either way, that's fine, okay? Because remember, how you list members inside a set does not matter, there's no ordering, okay? What about the union? So the union of A and B in this case is A, B, C, D. Yep, A, B, C, D. Uh, why not A, B, B, C, C, D? Exactly. That's why B only appears once and C only appears once, okay? Because everything in a set has to be unique. All right, excellent. So we're getting a pretty good grasp. Yep. Uh, just a quick question. So if you know that I am in one set, you could have been married with any, with any given set you define, right? So I'm just one from B right now. Oh, you cannot see which ones? Yeah. Again. Does it help? Yeah. Or are you referring to the text in the in the text material? No, I'm just I'm trying to find out. Like I don't know what kind of set this is. Is it just like a set of two is an element is in the union of two sets, which would be two different elements that are common elements. If it's in at least one of them. That is correct. Yep. So would this be a separation problem? Um, it's doing basically the, the or when it comes to membership, whereas an intersection is doing the and when it comes to membership. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Because the symbols, I, I know you cannot you know, read the entire thing because, you know, because of my uh, podium. But when you, okay, let me scroll up, um, okay. I just want to scroll to the point where you can see A union B uses a conjunction, but A union B uses a disjunction. That's the only difference between those two. And you can also see the similarity between the operator because the union operator has is opening up just like the OR operator is opening up. 
and then the, con the intersection operator is opening down, just like the conjunction operator is also opening down, because those two are related. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So the union is useful. I can give you an example you know, of uh, the usefulness of union. So let's say you know, set A are all the professors that can teach math classes, and set B are all the professors who can teach CIS classes. Okay? So the intersection would be referring to professors who can teach both math and computer science classes. But the union is basically the new division, because you know, that's everybody who can teach math or computer science classes. But there's no either in that or. So they can be both, can be just math, can be just computer science. Is that okay? So it's like the case of either or where it's like it's not either or you're doing both. That is correct. Either or is exclusive or. Yeah. In uh, CISP 310, because you took CISP 310, uh, so exclusive or is E O R or X O R, you know, in terms of how we spell that. Yep. But regular or is just vertical bar, vertical bar. So are we still doing okay? All right. Yep, go ahead. And where do you get the C or B hmm? Say again? Um, the C on B, is there? Oh, in the example? So the C is, C oh, is yeah, in the, I, I found, yeah. I oh, okay. okay, all right, all right. So we have two more operators or one more operator, or two more operators that return a set. The third operator is a difference. So in this case, um, A minus B are basically elements, is a set, okay? So first of all, it returns a set. What are the, what is the membership of that set? It will be every member that is everything that is a member of A, but not a member of B. Things that can only be found in A, but not in B. Okay, so let's apply this to the example that we are already working on. So now what about A minus B? What is the, the difference between A and B? Which is, this time I can actually type it, A minus B. Okay, so what would that be? Just A, that is correct, okay? Because it's every member of set A that is not in set B. Now, set A only has members A, B, and C. But of those three, only A, lowercase a, is in A but not in B. Because B and C are both found in set B. So this means you know, the answer to this question is A alone in the set. Is that okay? Yes? So um, <coughs> these operators return a different set? Like they just, they just don't have to create a new set? They get like a set yes. for each? Okay. Yeah, it returns a new set. If you are to implement this in a programming language, then it will return a new object, basically. So it's not returning one of the two objects that you create. You create it differently. Mm -hmm. Yep. So then, why does uh, why does that matter? Because you're saying that the operators return a set rather than return one. So is that just um, more powerful? Okay. So in the real life example, I can be asking, you know, let's say set A are all the people who can teach math classes, okay. and set B are all the people who can teach computer science classes. So A minus B in that case would be the professors who can only teach math classes. Because we are excluding people who can teach both math and computer science classes. So you are basically saying, okay, I, I want almost everybody here, but I'm excluding people or excluding elements that are also members of another set. good so far? Now, this type of thing turns out to be actually really useful for people who are artists. People like artists, you mean people who take fine art classes and people who draw stuff and so on? Yes, because there are programs that allow you to draw different shapes. 
So circles, triangles, and so on and so forth. And most programs that allow you to draw those shapes allow you to specify set operations on those shapes to create new shapes. Okay? Once again, I'm going to use the whiteboard. Okay, I'm just going to use a circle and a triangle. Okay? So look at the circle as one set. Look at the triangle as another set. So in a lot of these graphics programs, they allow you to specify um, intersection between the two. So the intersection between these two is this shape here. Is that okay? And there are some occasions where you just want that shape. So this is the intersection. There are occasions where you want to go like, oh, I want to draw a keyhole. That is the union of the shapes. Okay? And there are occasions where you go like, I want a Pac-Man facing down. Okay, I know I'm dating myself. We're talking about Pac-Man. How many people do not know what is Pac-Man? Okay, Pac-Man is a video game character that kind of goes around, you know, collect. Is it, are those beans or what? Orbs. Orbs. Yeah. And it will, if it eats something special, it can chase up with the ghosts, and otherwise, you it has to avoid being chased by ghosts. Anyway. A Pac-Man is this shape here. So if this is a union, excuse me, th if this is a intersection, this is a union, what is this? Difference. So the concepts that we are learning in this class, you know, set notation, turns out to be hmm, actually useful for artists. Yes, go ahead. The intersection is removed. So basically, the, the difference is the circle itself, okay? But anything that is also in the triangle needs to be removed. Okay, so there's That's why the red piece is gone. So there's not a set that just says, hey, this is the set that all the elements that do not intersect between the best elements. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. Okay. So let's see how we can get to that, okay? So you're asking, how do we specify, okay, so this time I, I need to color, you know, because otherwise I cannot tell you which part is in the shape. So you're basically saying, what? how can I specify stuff that is in the circle, stuff that is in the triangle, but not the stuff that is in common, right? That's what you want to specify, okay? So let's call the circle A and then we'll call the triangle B. What you need here is A union with B minus A intersection with B. Okay. So there's still a way to specify it using set notation. It's just that it's not, it, you cannot do it with a single uh, set operator that is defined in today's class. Now, is it is it useful enough to define a new set operator just to specify this? Maybe, okay, I'm not sure. But you can already specify this using union, intersection, and difference. All right. Okay, so we are currently, at this point, you know, we just talked about difference. The next one is Cartesian product. It takes a little bit longer to explain that one, so I'm going to defer that to next Wednesday. So you have a whole week, which is 100 and, what, 80, 168 hours before the next class or thereabout. What are you going to do with these 168 hours? How do you study? I mean, this is really difficult to study, you know, in a sense, because I'm just declaring the definition of things, right? So the best way to study is to ask chat GPT to give you examples. So give me examples of the union of sets. Give me examples of the intersection of 
elements of a set of sets. Give me examples of interse I mean, uh, difference between elements of a of set. You can do that, okay? You know, I, I will figure out the query, you know, the, the chat GPT query, and I will post the questions that GPT is going to generate. But for those of you who have subscription to chat GPT or anything like that, you can do that also by yourself. You can basically you know, have practice examples you know, that you can generate out of the material that we have here. But I, I still have to fix the text so far because you know, it, it does contain some errors because I did not anticipate that I have to use double backslash to escape the backslash itself. So I have to fix all of those before this becomes useful. All right, well, I know it is odd to say this, but have a, have a nice weekend. <laughs> and I'll see you in a week. It is Wednesday, and I'm saying have a nice weekend. So you're the one who put in a prerequisite challenge in the... I sent it to you and yeah. I sent it to the ARC CIS crew. Oh, you did? Okay. Cool. I, didn't, I, I just wanted to make okay. sure it got out okay. there because yeah. I need to know whether... Do you know which uh, 360 know section you want to add to? 360 section. Yeah, because you're mm -hmm. challenging the prerequisite of CISP 360, yes. which is CIS, CISP 300. So you're trying to get into 360. Yeah, I, I'm actually in a 360 course right Okay, now, so but who, who's your professor? Uh, Kaka -san? Kaka -san, yeah. Okay, so I can send her email directly mm -hmm. to say that you know, I am clearing your prerequisite to that class. Okay. That is not a problem. Mm -hmm. But because you have not taken 360, so you're two classes yeah, away. Yeah, that's, that's why I was figuring <laughs> it's like there's, there's too many chains. I just yeah, from... Your no, interaction no, no. today, you know, I, I think you have a good grasp of the math as far as set locations are concerned. Mm. But when we get to recursion and induct proof like induction, that can get a little challenging with That's that exposure to, to recursion. You're, you're the expert here, so I'll, I'll just go up here. I would rather not like fail this class or something and do some yeah. screwed over for the rest. Yeah. So uh, I'll figure out how to drop the class for you seriously. But yeah. I'll see you. Yep, two semesters. All right. Yep. All right. See ya. You should be getting there for I mean, no, I was just going to say that there is uh, a tutorial that was called on that class. And that's what I was referring to. No, they, they're, okay. They, they are not using. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> I have used this okay. on previous this is, classes. This is a really bad use of a Venn diagram because in, in a SQL joint, it is not an intersection. That's how everyone explains it. No, 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 no. Literally, that's how I was no, able to understand it. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Because in SQL, a joint operation between two tables mm -hmm. is more of a connection. It is more related to Cartesian product than it is with intersection. Oh my god, that just shot the wrong way completely. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. I didn't no, realize it was going to do that. that. It's nice with it. <laughs> so moosh. I'm not gonna sniff it, but mm. since I I can smell it from here, it's cool. Pop those <laughs> mm. so cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's how I learned it, though. <laughs> yeah, but they are not the same. Okay. So when we get to Cartesian product, you will get to see what the joint operation here is, because it's a Cartesian product. But the condition that you specify in the joint, the inner joint is basically a Cartesian product, but it's looking for a value from the first table to be the same as the value of the second table. Right. So it's not an intersection because the end product is a table that is bigger than the two tables that you saw up here. Oh. Okay. 
They're not even the same, they don't have the same format because we are basically you know, taking all the fields from the first table, taking all the fields from the second table in order to make the new table or the, the query result have more speed. It's combining the first and the second table. So essentially if you have a column that says from one to 10 and then on the first table and then another column on the first column of the second table, it's one to 10 as well. Then when you do the join the section, it's just gonna pick one to 10 because mm -hmm. they're both, they're still gonna be in that order, but We kinda. need the set notation to make it, depending on whether it's a left versus a right Correct. one, yeah. you can have things that do not match. Mm -hmm. That's what those joins are for, is for things that do not match. Okay, yeah. okay. It's still, this, this makes sense to me, it's kind of run there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But they're about the same concept, but they're okay. just a little bit easier. Yeah, I wanna, so for as far as like reading the logic, mm -hmm. like at home, like what kind of the traits that you just you say that would you ever skip over one in this class no. or do you cover all in this class? No, we we we, we cover those in the future. Okay, that's that's fine. That was kind of going off of like what with that all the things you all yeah. asked. Okay, because I wanted to ask. Um, I don't know. I want to know if we were moving on to something else for next week, even though you told us to read this um, for this week and yeah. cover it. Because um, is I it most of it yep. makes sense? I'm having a hard time with quantifiers, and I was wondering if you're going to get to it. Oh, we will get to quantifiers. So the way I do this is, you know, we are in a basic set not notation right now. Mm -hmm. So the next topic is basic quantifier, and then we go to big operators, and then we go to set notation using quantifiers. So that's the sequence that I'm go going to go back. Got it. Okay. I thought you were going to cover all four of those today. Oh no. So okay, that's <laughs> more co that's more comforting. I thought you were going to cover all four of those today. So I was trying to nope. read all of them and I was having a hard time with quantifying. Yeah, the, the, the first thing, you know, I think uh, the only thing I was planning to do is to cover some of the basic set notations. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, Because yep. that made sense. And then when I got to module 382, mm -hmm. that was making sense until you, until I got to the quantifiers. Yep. Yep. And then going back, it just, I don't know, it doesn't Okay, so a uh, quick tip with quantifiers. Mm -hmm. um, the little, Inverted A symbol? Yeah, yeah, the all symbol. Or yeah. yeah. That is the same thing as every. So think of cases where you use the word every mm -hmm. or all. Okay, okay, so every seagull likes eating potato chips, chips yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So that means, you know, if something is a seagull, that something is going to like potato chips. But if you use the funny, funky looking E, the sum. there exists. That's, um, it's some, exactly. So if you say some seagulls like potato chips, that implies at least one seagull in this entire world likes potato chips. But we don't know w how many do not like potato chips. But then uh, as you, as you, as I was reading further, it was using the sum, mm -hmm. like the sum quantifier symbol, I guess is what you would call it, to denote one or to denote one specific type when it started involving like the uh, the if and only the if when it was talking about putting them into what was that word that you used? It was the P word. The predicate. Yeah, it, when it, they started involving it in predicates, it was start start talking about that being involved in one element or of of a set, and they used that some word some symbol. Yeah. I can. It's called. It's also called the existential quantifier. Yeah, <laughs> that's a long little word of, you know, describe it. But it really is just saying you know, at least one. That's all we can say is at least one. And that that's equivalent to the using the word sum for. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. That makes that makes that makes sense. Got it. All right. That's all. Yep. Okay. I had a question about the correct table, like checking it. Um, I sent in my transcript, like, from ARC. Uh -huh. Can you show me, like, is that okay? Um, well, I can take a look right now. Uh, what's your last name? Jane. J-I-A-N-E. J-I-A-N-E. Okay. okay, that's you. So yeah, okay. You just turned it in, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that should be fine. You know, does it have your name on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It yeah, that should be fine. Okay. I have I, I haven't gotten the chance to grade it yet today. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. 
Yeah, I, I did grade it like this morning, so you might have you must have turned it in like after ten thirty or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, okay. that's why. Okay, Chris. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So did I drop you? Excuse me. Nope, you're still here. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, can you really just roll call? Uh, one of my favorite ones 